those of us who are language geeks, I'm kind of stoked about it. Uh, uh, we've got uh, four folks who are going to be presenting, and then of course we've got our, our good lecture coming tonight uh, by Stephen, so you'll, you'll get to hear that tonight as well, I, I assume, uh, if you'll be back for that. But for this afternoon, let's, let me call up to the stage our panelists. We're going to be talking about languages of the Bible to some degree or another. And so uh, uh, I'll start with Peter, who's a longtime friend of the library. Peter Davids has his bachelor's in psychology, took an MDiv uh, from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, TEDS, uh, and then his PhD from the University of Manchester, has been very kind to give the library his, uh, his library. So many of the books that we've got, uh, uh, we owe to Peter and his wife. And it's nice in two ways. First, it's a wonderful resource for everybody to use. But second, it means Peter's up at the library on a regular basis doing research and writing because he's still an active scholar. So we'll see him and Judith up there. And, and uh, I think, Peter, just recently you've published a new book on uh, the theology of James, Peter, and Jude. And uh, uh, I'm sure he's also working on something else as well. He's done a Greek handbook on uh, Jude and Second Peter, uh, has spent a lot of time doing that, teaching a number of different courses. So Peter, uh, if you'll come grab one of the seats up here, uh, would you all join me in welcoming Peter Davids? And next we've got Jeff Peterson. Now Jeff comes to us uh, from uh, across town at, uh, 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 as well. And uh, uh, we are deeply, no, actually you're over in uh, Austin. Yeah, that's a suburb out 290. <laughs> It's not cross town. My my mistake. Peter, of course, is uh, anyway. Um, Jeff has his uh, bachelor's degree in biblical languages uh, uh, from Abilene Christian. Is that right? I couldn't get into Lipscomb, could you? Okay, uh, sorry. I have my degrees in biblical languages from Lipscomb, so it's uh, just a little inside lack of a joke. Um, Master's uh, in Biblical Studies from ACU, an MDiv from Princeton Theological Seminary with a concentration in Old Testament, and then a PhD in New Testament Studies from Yale uh, uh, University. Uh, he's got uh, a number of books out. His forthcoming book, Folly to Gentiles, The Death and Resurrection of Jesus in the Faith of the First Christians, uh, is under contract right now with Baker Academic Press. Uh, he's an active member of SBL, which means you'll find him... Uh, uh, there at the end of November, I would assume. And uh, uh, he is here as well, has come in to help us with this. Would you join me in welcoming Dr. Jeff Peterson? Thank you, Jeff. And next, we'll go to Weston Fields. Uh, uh, Weston Fields, uh, I just introduced last night. Many of you know Weston. He's lectured here. Uh, he gave a lecture last night out in Lubbock, Texas. Uh, well attended, seven, eight hundred people. Uh, just did a fantastic job, and it was an honor to get to be out there with him last night. Uh, uh, he, Weston, uh, has uh, as many degrees as a thermometer. He's got a bachelor's degree, he's got a couple of master's degrees, he's got a couple of doctoral degrees, he's truly a paradox uh, with a doctorate in uh, a PhD as well as a DTA or a doctor of theology. Um, uh, his degrees uh, uh, are mirrored by his dexterity in a number of different languages, having taught Hebrew, having taught Greek, uh, speaking modern Hebrew fluently, uh, reading ancient Hebrew, uh, I'm sure studied Akkadian and a number of other courses as well, and uh, is, is taught Greek. Uh, uh, so he's in a unique position, uh, keeping up with all of that, as well as his job as the executive director for the last quarter of a century almost for the Dead Sea Scrolls Foundation, overseeing a publication. I think there are about 40 volumes in print right now, another 15 under contract. And I found out from Weston yesterday, just this week, about two more fragments that are, are becoming known publicly now and that we'll, he'll have to 
raise money to uh, uh, get published at some point in time. So anyway, Weston has been very gracious to stay over and to help us. If those of you who don't know, he's also a salmon fisherman for the last 50 years, a commercial salmon fisherman who truly was tending to putting up his boats and nets and everything in Kodiak Island, Alaska, Wednesday when he flew in. So uh, 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 he's, uh, he's fresh from the sea. And so would you join me in welcoming Dr. Weston Fields. And then our featured speaker tonight, uh, uh, as well as this afternoon, is Dr. Stephen Notley. Now, I don't know how to tell you this, but in, to some degrees, this community is a, a very um, interwoven community. Uh, there are certain levels of, of scholastic work where Everybody, if they don't know you, they at least know someone who knows you, and they're able to sit and talk. And, and so we're at lunch, and Dr. Jim Hoffmeyer, who, of course, is an Egyptologist and dug in Egypt for a long time and was born in Egypt, and blah, blah, blah. We find out that, that uh, he and, and uh, Sharon Herbert right there uh, both uh, dug in Egypt. You know, and they don't know that each other dug in Egypt, but there they were, and what can you say? And so they, they're able to talk about this, that, and the other. G is that trash dump still in the middle of town, yes, and uh, it was a really dry, uh, fascinating conversation. But uh, I tell you that to say that uh, uh, Dr. Stephen Notley, I will give a more full introduction tonight but for your purposes, I will give you one of the stories of the sordid underbelly of activity that goes on amongst this community. So the Notley family was in Jerusalem, as I understand the story, where Stephen was studying uh, to apply himself diligently to the tasks and opportunities that God placed at his disposal. While Weston Fields was there as well, studying at Hebrew University, and I understand they were in a, a reading group together of sorts with uh, Flusser and some others, and, and they had their kids there at a common school. And it seems that uh, at the uh, ripe young grade of third grade, uh, Dr. Weston Fields' son uh, paid a shekel, I think a, a quarter, a shekel to Dr. Stephen Notley's daughter for his first kiss. And so um, these people, they've got relationships we don't even begin to understand. But hopefully we'll sort through those over the next hour, hour and a half as we have some discussions about the languages of the Bible. So from New York City, would you join me in welcoming Dr. Stephen Notley? Okay, so I get to uh, uh, serve as, as the MC of sorts. Some people were wise enough to send me their questions that they think might be helpful to ask them. Um, others are just sort of leaving it to pot luck, which will make it really uh, there at my mercy. So I thought I would start out and I'd be friendly with some easy softballs before we really get into some good questions. So, we've got a microphone that you guys are going to need to use. If you'll pull that off, I think it's turned on. And uh, here, I got it. I got it. There you go. And when you use the microphone, if you'd hold it straight to your, even touch your bottom lip, uh, it will pick up much better for you. Uh, first question, uh, Weston, you're holding the microphone. That means it's to you. How many languages in the Bible? Pick up. Yeah, 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 this is trivia. Stump the panel. How many it's languages not, in the Bible? It's not on? Yeah, it should be on. Okay. Hold it straight up to your mouth. Straight, straight up to my mouth? Can you give us a little more volume? Is that there? Maybe? Yeah, yeah. Well, All right. How many languages in the Bible can you think of? Well, I mean, the obvious three, uh, plus, plus there's a, probably a little bit of Babylonian. That all right, so, all right, now your obvious three, we've got people from all different walks of life here. Throw them out there. Uh, Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. All right. 
And you might think there's a little Babylonian. Well, I guess I, it depends on, uh, yeah, maybe. Okay. All right. Anybody want to add anything? <laughs> no Latin on the cross? Yeah. All right. All right. Just throw it out there. All right. <laughs> All right, so we've got a little bit of Latin, maybe. Isn't there a Latin phrase, a Latin word or two? Or is that just in the movie? Centurion, there's a love word or two. Yeah. There you go. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so uh, uh, let's, let's uh, talk about the mingling. And, and Hoffmeyer? I'm probably not going to make you come up here because we only have four chairs. But if we, if we start lagging, I might pass the mic back to you, so I'd be paying attention. Um, loan words. I want to talk about loan words. Uh, and Hoffmeyer would be in a good position to talk about some of the Egyptian loan words that we find in the Old Testament. But uh, talk to us about loan words. And I want this to be a panel discussion, so here's the way we'll start. Weston, if you want to throw out a loan word or two and then pass the mic and someone else and explain what they are and uh, what do we know about them and what use are they? Well, there's uh, pardes, uh, meaning garden is a Persian loan word. Um, in uh, Song of Solomon, I think. Or, is it, or is it Kohelet, anyway. Um, Lots, you, lots of them, lots of them. You, you get off. I mean, something like Abba is really uh, an Aramaic loan word in Hebrew. Um, now, I want you to explain this to people. Who, let, me, let me introduce you to Bill Young. Bill Young's an engineer, really bright guy, but he has no biblical languages at all. But okay. he is faithful to come to my class every Sunday morning and pay attention <laughs> because his wife makes him. So, I, yeah, and he's also Googling what you're saying to see if you're right. No. So <laughs> I want you to explain to Bill and to everybody else out here, first, what is a loan word? Okay, a loan word is simply a word that's uh, native to one language, but uh, is used enough in another language that it, uh, for, for often for the, for the speakers of the second language, it's, it's just as native as any other word. They don't realize it's a loan word. Uh, but, um, but it can be traced back to another language before the language that's used in. Okay, gracias. Would you, oh, excuse me, that's a loan word. Thank you. Would you, yes, Jeff. I, I just thought of an example. Enchilada. Enchilada is a loan, is a loan word. word. Enchilada. Yes. That's okay. Right. Very good. So, Jeff, give us some loan words uh, that you that come to your mind as you're sitting up there and Weston's having to to be the first guinea pig. I I should clarify. Enchilada is not a biblical loan word. <laughs> <laughs> I, we used it a lot when I lived in Houston. Um, I I tossed mine out. I'll explain it. Uh, Centurion is the Latin word for a commander of a company of a hundred or thereabouts uh, in the Roman army. The proper Greek word is hekaton tarkes. Uh, when Mark writes the story of the crucifixion uh, in Greek, he talks about the centurion, the centurion, uh, who uh, claims Jesus as son of God on the cross. When Matthew and Luke write that account up, they uh, both use hekaton tarkes, uh, the Greek word. So, Excellent example. Um, okay, uh, you got something to add, Peter? You got a loan word? Actually, I'm interested in the loan words in English. Uh, for instance, uh, apostle. Now, that's a transliterated word. We think of it as an English word. It's actually, of course, a Greek word, you know, for a emissary or an official delegate of somebody. But we've just picked it up right in English. There's a number of words, uh, Christ means, you know, the anointed or Messiah, but Messiah would be, of course, another, just a loan word from another language, and, and, and so on. Of course, we've already had one of the ones in, uh, in the New Testament, we had, we had the other one, which in the New Testament that's common is Abba. Now, right after that, we go and we translate it, you know, um, 
with uh, the Greek word pater, father. So, so you know what it, so the Greek reader knows what it means. So yeah, we have a scattering of them. That's sort of technical terms from like you were pointing out, but um, uh, we, we've, we've actually brought into English some words which I'm not sure we understand, but we think we do because they've sort of been adopted. I know that Weston, if we pass the mic down to Steve, we're gonna let Steve really do, take off on this, but Weston and I were talking yesterday, Weston last night told me that he wrote, was it your master's thesis or your dissertation on Ecclesiastes? Yeah, master's, thesis. master's thesis, and Ecclesiastes, one of the words is hevel, which is translated vanity, translated a number of different things, and, and a lot of scholars or at least several scholars of note have suggested that we ought to just anglicize a word for Hevel because we're really missing the, the import of it when we try to force it into a different word. We ought to just make it a loan word and, and try to explain it. That obviously is going nowhere. But Steve, loan words. You've studied words forever, so talk to us. Uh, well, well, I'm going to talk a little bit tonight about that in terms of a language back and forth, particularly between Aramaic and Hebrew and the whole discussion about the languages of Jesus. But I mean, I would just tack on as well. We've got a number of, um, I don't know if you call them loan words, they're transliterations. We're penetrating particularly in Mark and Matthew's gospel, uh, Talitha Kumi. You've got uh, words that are showing up in the, in the uh, cry from the cross, uh, Mark's cry from the cross. So you, you have, uh, you know, it's evidence that you have multiple languages within the land that are sort of uh, both present there. Okay. okay. What, uh, um, what, we're keeping you stay, with you, you for a moment. Me, okay. Yeah. What language background do you have that's allowed you to penetrate some of these studies? I'm from Oklahoma. <laughs> Hey, that, that's okay. <laughs> that's it. The, uh, no, it's, I, the, my journey took me to Jerusalem, uh, and while I was there, I learned, was immersed in Hebrew. Uh, of course, I was, learned biblical Hebrew, biblical Greek, but it's a different thing when you immerse yourself in a language and it becomes a living part of you. You, you gain a greater sensitivity to it so that whenever you're particularly... I tell people with sort of tongue in cheek, when I'm reading the New Testament, I'm reading Greek but thinking Hebrew because there are certain issues of word order and expression uh, that, are, uh, that, that sometimes aren't sensitive unless you're immersed in the language. So primarily, I mean, I work in all three of the languages that were prevalent, the primary languages that were prevalent in uh, Judea in the first century, Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic, uh, but particularly... Uh, Greek and Hebrew are the ones that I, I focus on and specialize in terms of my work in historical Jesus and the Gospels. Does that, does that answer your yeah, question? Yeah, that's, that's exactly... a splendid answer. So what is it that, that took your interest um, into that area, if I could? What, why um, make it a field of study? It was interesting. It, was, uh, and it should always be a lesson to... Uh, teachers, you never know what crazy exercise you do in a class can send a student in a very interesting direction. Um, I took uh, a graduate class in Septuagint, which is the Greek Bible. It's the translation of the Hebrew Bible into Greek. And uh, we worked doing comparison, how, how they would translate Hebrew into Greek. And again, this is in the second, third century BC and uh, looking at how they rendered it, because every translation is an interpretation. Every time you translate, no matter what language, even our English Bibles are a process of interpretation, uh, because every language has idioms in it, and you, like my, in New York City, I have Korean students. Imagine what they think when they hear that it's raining cats and dogs. Uh, <laughs> you don't translate that literally. It's, uh, there's a certain interpretation process. So we were going through this exercise. We'd spend most of the class sort of breaking our teeth over translating Hebrew into Greek and looking how they were rendering it and the ideas, the thinking that was behind how they rendered the Hebrew. And then the last 10 minutes of class, the professor would say, okay, now we've seen how they render Hebrew into Greek. Let's look at something else. 
and he would take and we would look at the identical structures or expressions in the gospel, and then he would turn the thing on its head and say, okay, we're reading the same expression in Greek. What is the Hebrew that's behind it? What is the Semitic phraseology or the idiom that's there? And it, you know, for a young student, it triggered in me an understanding that there were actually more levels to this than I had, that I had thought. And it, I became sort of fascinated with the whole field of uh, Semitic backgrounds to the Greek of the, of the Gospels. And eventually, it's a journey, but it eventually took me to Jerusalem uh, to study with David Flusser. Okay, marvelous. Now, we're going to hear a lot from you tonight. I've got to warn you, you're not allowed to tell us this afternoon something you're going to tell us tonight. So if I trick you into that by the questions I ask, just tell me. Uh, uh, my lawyers instructed me not to answer. And uh, uh, <laughs> mean, meanwhile, <laughs> meanwhile, uh, what I want to do with you three is, is the mic is passed down. Uh, um, uh, Stephen has opened up a really good subject here, and that are, is the subject of Hebraisms in the Bible, in the Greek New Testament specifically. And so I'm going to ask each of you three to come up with a Hebraism that you're aware of in the Greek New Testament that you have found enlightening or illuminating. Weston, you have the extra obligation of having to do one where the illumination came in part from the Dead Sea Scrolls, since you are uh, uh, Mr. DSS, okay? Um, uh, so, uh, uh, and, and, but you've also can, can fall back on uh, yoke or, or any number of ones that you may want to use in that regard. Uh, uh, I would ask you perhaps to consider using, uh, uh, well, why don't you, why, can I ask for a specific one or do you have one you'd rather do? I would like you to do not the one you did last night, but I instead uh, the one about uh, 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 Mary and Joseph are betrothed, yes, and we have uh, uh, a righteous Joseph being righteous decides he will not. Okay, go. Put the mic up. They can't hear you if you don't. All right, uh, so... Um on the way back from Lubbock last night, about midnight. I think we were talking about it on the plane, weren't we? Uh, no, or somewhere else. Anyway. May have been in the car, it plane, I don't matter, know. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, this, is, this uh, came out of my time in Jerusalem as well. Um, and uh, it has to do with the verse in Matthew uh, chapter 1, where we have the description of Mary and Joseph, and it says that... Um, uh, they were engaged, and then uh, Joseph found out that she was pregnant. And because he was a dikaios, using the Greek word, man. Uh, dikaios meaning a righteous, a righteous man. Uh, like, okay, uh, usually go ahead. translated righteous, uh, that he was going to put her away, that is, divorce her privately, because even with engagement, in the Jewish culture, a sort of divorce would have been necessary. And uh, that always struck me as a little strange. I mean, it didn't quite jive. Until um, one time I was thinking, uh, and this was in Jerusalem too, uh, about the fact that the total semantic range of the, the word um, uh, righteousness, of course, in English is somewhat different from the word uh, dikaios, but I got to thinking, I wonder if there's something else in this total semantic range, that is a whole range of meanings uh, that one could use for translating that Greek word into English. And uh, then I thought of the word tzaddik, which is Hebrew. Spell, uh, gener can you gen generally? Spell that so people who don't pronounce it won't know what you're doing. T Z D K. Yeah. Tzaddik, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, tzaddik would be T Z A D I Q. Usually, it would be transliterated. Now, uh, tzaddik can be, uh, or tzidka could be righteousness, or tzaddik could be a righteous person. But also in Hebrew, a tzaddik. 
uh, is, a, is a special meaning. A tzaddik could be somebody who is kind or who is compassionate or understanding uh, or just like a good person. That's a tzaddik. And um, so um, I thought to myself, I wonder if uh, in the Hebrew background to the, to the Gospel of Matthew, uh, there would have been a better word to choose in Greek than uh, dikaios, or at least in the, in the process of translation, dikaios had added to it something uh, to the semantic range. And so I wrote an article about that a number of years ago, and whoever was doing the uh, revision to the Arndt and Gingrich uh, lexicon for uh, Greek uh, ad saw the article and added that to the total semantic range of dikaios that's in, in the latest edition of Arndt and Gingrich from the University of Chicago. Uh, but then, um, yesterday, when I was getting ready for this talk I was giving, I thought to myself, well, I really haven't checked this in the scrolls, so so let me let me try that. And I have uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, in my laptop, um, all 40 volumes scanned. So I did a search, and uh, I found I found a uh, a place in the scrolls where there is um, this expression, la uh, asot uh, tzidka, again the same root tzadik. And that, that means like to give alms or to be compassionate and so forth. So that, that kind of confirmed my idea that now is in the lexicon somewhere. <laughs> and, um, and so I would, you know, I would go back and translate that verse then uh, in English based on all this stuff. Something like, um, Joseph found out that Mary was pregnant. And, put in parentheses, although according to the law and the custom of the time, he would have had to divorce her uh, because they were only engaged. Now, back to the verse. But because he was a tzaddik, he was righteous in the sense that he was compassionate, not in the sense that he kept the letter of the law. He was compassionate. Uh, he was understanding. Uh, he was going to... Um, uh, divorce her privately, but as we know, the end of this story, an angel came along and said, "Don't do it." So that's 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 one sort of involved, but that's that's one thing you can do with the way that semantic ranges get somewhat changed in translation and meanings accrue to the uh, target language that is like dikaios um, from the source language, uh, which are sometimes not recognized. All right, make sure that we're all understanding this together. So under Hebrew law at the time, there would need to be a public divorce because they were publicly engaged. Is that right? Well, yeah, I mean, I think the point would have been more than, almost more than public divorce. It might have been more, more punishment than that. But yeah, at, at, at the least, very least. At, at, the least, very, at, at the very least, yes. At least a public divorce. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it's a bit odd to be reading, if you're aware of that, it's a bit odd to be reading the idea of our English translation that, that Joseph being a righteous man decided to do it quietly and off to the side because a righteous man in our legal sense of righteousness right. Right. would follow the letter of the law exactly. and would make an exam public example of her. Yeah. yeah. And so, but you're saying that we misunderstand the English concept of a righteous man, right. the dikaios there should be from the tzaddik instead, which is a person of compassion as right. well as right. righteousness. Right. Right. Is, is, is that right? Yes. Uh -huh. Cool. All right. Mike goes down. Give us a, Hebra or a Hebraism uh, uh, that stands out to you in, in uh, the New Testament. Illuminating. I think this may be the simplest Hebraism in the New Testament, actually, which uh, I found very impressive when I discovered it some time ago. In I, I didn't go as far as Stephen did. Uh, I went to West Texas uh, to discover Hebraisms uh, and uh, Semitisms in the New Testament. I, 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 I wish I had had the good sense to keep going. We have um, the same sand that they have. I mean, I, West Texas is very... Go ahead. The climate was right. <laughs> well, well I, got, I got part of the experience then. Um, Hebrew narrative uh, is, uh, much of it tends to be, especially in the Torah, 
uh, tends to be, uh, the technical term is paratactic in style. That is to say, you take one clause, you set it alongside another clause, you connect them with the simplest connective there is, and in English, it's va in Hebrew, it's chi in Greek. It's very odd to read texts like this in Greek. Uh, and so you come upon a passage like uh, in Mark chapter 15 uh, and verse 24, they crucified Jesus and they divided his garments, casting lots over them, uh, who would take them, and it was the third hour and they crucified him, is a, is a literal rendering of the text, which sounds like uh, Mark is a clumsy narrator, uh, or he has, uh, uh, you have various suggestions that are sometimes made. He's conflated sources and hasn't noticed that there's a repetition, uh, something like that. It became popular in the 19th century, especially in Germany, to assume that every modern reader knows more than a biblical writer, uh, and so Mark just must have been a clumsy editor and botched those together. Uh, well, in fact, the, the Hebrew uh, connective, uh, vav uh, can convey different senses and, and uh, the reader is allowed to infer different relationships between clauses. And so I think most of our translations actually handle this uh, just fine. I don't know what, how the NASB, which tends to be a very literal translation from the, the Hebrew and the Greek, don't know what they do with it. Uh, but the appropriate translation is it was the third hour when they crucified him. It's not that Mark is simply forgotten to tell us that, uh, that he was crucified. Uh, the, the, the consecutive clause gives further information. And so uh, uh, reading the Bible, reading the Old Testament in Hebrew helps one read, especially Mark and the book of Revelation, uh, uh, which are our most Semitically uh, colored texts in the New Testament with, uh, with understanding and with a bit more appreciation. Mark wrote Greek as a second language he wrote it in biblical idiom, uh, uh, and so his, uh, the way he tells the story of Jesus evokes the way that the Old Testament tells the story of Moses, other stories. There's, a, there's another little, uh, a, a point that's often suggested about Mark. This is the, this is the second simplest uh, Semitism in the New Testament, maybe, or Hebraism. Um, uh, uh, writers of the Gospels will often uh, introduce uh, a phrase in Greek with a connective that you find in Old Testament narrative translated in, say, the King James Version, and it came to pass, uh, which is just a way of providing uh, transition from one incident to another. Well, Mark will sometimes render, and it came to pass, uh, with, a, uh, with a pair of Greek words, kai agenita. Sometimes, uh, however, in fact, more often, he'll introduce paragraphs with kai euthus, and immediately. Well, four times in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, kai euthus renders this Hebrew transitional passage. So while it's often said that Mark's style is characterized by a great deal of immediacy, and this would have appealed to Roman readers, that sort of thing, that, that may be the case, and it's certainly a, a, a bold, vivid narrative, but, but this and immediately is also an aspect of Mark's biblical style. Uh, he's, he's telling a story in the style of the Bible. Uh, very self-consciously. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you. All right, Peter, and, and I ought to put some restriction on you like I did Weston. I think you ought to have to come up with a Hebraism, and I should have warned you about this because you've probably got one ready to go, but I hope it's from one of the, the books that you've published on recently or something. Sure, sure. Um, you know, it's, uh, by the way, I should say that I'm glad you put me down at this end of the table because I'm at the right hand of the guy back there. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, I might have been a little bit nervous I was at the other end of the table, uh, besides getting questions earlier. Um, actually, uh, the, one of your problems with translation, and I've worked on at least three biblical Bible translations, well, three Bible translations, uh, one of your problems with translations is that if you don't translate something, people don't understand. If you do translate it, you've made a choice. And um, so uh, it was an, an ancient quip, all, translations, all translators are liars. A and there's some truth in that because you have, you've made choices for people so that they can understand something. Um, 
Yeah, the, the one which I thought of, and um, actually all these, these other uh, responses have um, raised all sorts of other interesting questions, is the one in James, and James, um, uh, in James uh, 1, um, uh, 22, uh, where it says, be doers of the word, and not only hearers. Well, in good Greek, that would mean be a poet. Uh, a doer of a word, a wordsmith would be. Be a wordsmith uh, or something like that. A poet would be a, a, a wonderful example in Greek. But it's not. You know, it is do the word, just like Jesus says uh, in the Gospels. You know, do what I say or follow my teaching. And that comes from your, your uh, Semitic background. I don't know whether I would want to trace it back to Hebrew or Aramaic or whatever, but it does come from the Semitic background. But that raises a question. <laughs> and the other question, and, and which, which always comes up in this literature, uh, at least my literature, does the author speak himself, speak Hebrew or Aramaic, or has he read the uh, Septuagint so much that he's picked up his style? Now, that was impressed upon me as a uh, youth um, because I grew up in a church where we read King James, where um, in Germany at a certain age, you sort of get your first long pants. Uh, you know, uh, when you're confirmed. Well, my church didn't confirm, but at a certain time, you got your Schofield Bible, uh, you know, and <laughs> then, uh, then you were a man uh, <laughs> or whatever. Uh, that's the only thing I worried about being anyway. Uh, so um, I read and I read and I read and I read, and I can remember very clearly my English teacher marking some things wrong in my essays in my final year or so of, I've forgotten whether it's my junior or senior year of high school. Well, it wasn't because I knew some Greek or I knew something else. It was because I had put in a King Jamesism. I couldn't for the life of me figure out why it was wrong. It was in my, it was in my Bible or it was in my hymn book. So you don't necessarily, if you're using a translation, you don't necessarily, shall I say, understand what's behind it. You understand it because, but it's, it's the language you just sort of sunk into your blood, so to speak. All right, if we could pass the microphone down to Steve. Steve, do you have a good Hebraism that's not in your lesson tonight, not in your lecture tonight, that you could share with us? I, I want to piggyback off of that. Whatever you want to do. One of the, uh, it's not exactly a Hebraism, but it is a type of thing that sometimes is, is passed over. Um, we have the expression of to, to hear or to do. I tell my students, whenever, we he whenever you read in the text someone within the same breath talking about hearing and doing, they are echoing a, a first century debate. Uh, in the church today, we have all kinds of issues that we're fighting over, uh, various people taking sides. In the first century, there was an argument over um, which is more important, the study of Scripture or the living it out. Now, you could say, well, that's a debate in the, first, uh, the 21st century as well. But that debate is, is hung on a uh, verse. In Exodus 24-7, uh, the people are presented the Book of the Covenant, and they're asked to commit themselves to it. And they say, Na'asev and nishma. Literally, we will do and we will hear. Now, the way I've just translated it, you will find no modern translation that translates it that way because a modern translator sort of chokes on it the same way the rabbis did. It's the wrong order. You should hear and then you should say, we will hear and we will do. But the order is, is, is flipped, it's changed. And that sort of bump in the text, we sometimes in the modern, in our days, we see them as quote unquote problems. The rabbis saw that as an opportunity to preach. Uh, they saw those little wrinkles in the text as an opportunity, to, as a teaching moment. 
And so you have, think of Jesus telling the story about the foundations, the two foundations, the one who hears my word and does it. And you, you find all throughout the, the New Testament, you'll find this echo of a first century debate. Um, you can hear Jesus criticize also the Pharisees uh, in Matthew 23 uh, because they don't do. They don't. Jesus grows up in a family that put emphasis on carrying out, following through. Remember the time he was in a house um, and there was a knock at the door. Uh, this is in Luke 8. I know that Mark and Matthew are, have it from a slightly different perspective, but Luke's text reads, uh, there was a knock at the door, and they, they came to him, and they said, Jesus, your mother and your brothers are outside. And he stopped, and he says, my mother and my brothers, they are those who hear the word of God and do it. And so here you have him testifying that he grew up in a home that sort of weighed in on the action side of scripture. It belongs to sort of a stream of Jewish thought we refer to as anshe maaseh, the men of deeds, the men of action, those people who actually put emphasis on carrying out and living out the teaching that they read in scriptures, but put more emphasis upon the action of that. And so there's this thread, and it runs, and it's not, it, again, surfaces in James. You'll also find Paul makes reference, echoes it as well. But it's one of those sort of subtle, and it is a Hebrewism because it's reflecting uh, Exodus 24, 7, and it's, uh, we find it outside of uh, the New Testament as well in the Jewish sources. So it's this sort of thread of a, a Hebraic idea that winds its way through, through our New Testament. All right. In that regard, as you were talking, I was thinking about, uh, I, was, I think we were translating Colossians. So this is um, 30 years ago for me, 35 years ago. And uh, my professor, when we got to the passage in Colossians, it says, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, right. do all in the name of, of Jesus. And he said, word and deed, those concepts, when you put them together, is a totality. And so it's triply emphatic. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do everything in the name of. Um, same concept? Same concept, but a different, again, in Jewish thought, things are very verbal. This is one of the things coming from the West we don't always... I mean, I'm not saying no. I'm just saying that... He taught it as a Greek concept, not as a Hebraism. Uh, yeah, the one he, I'm just talking about is, is very much reflects... Um, it, when, when, when the sages are exegeting Scripture, in our seminaries, we a lot of times our exegesis of Scripture uh, oftentimes is conceptual at least more conceptual than you would find Jewish exegesis. Theirs is very verbal. It's really based on words, the, the collocation of key words and terms. And so, although, I mean, it's the same idea, and this one, this actually is based on that verse in Exodus and the, the, the showing up of that we will literally do and we will hear. I don't know how, I can't think of the modern, some of the modern translations, but even for a modern translator, because we both, we sort of hesitate, and they'll translate it, um, we will do and be obedient, or something like that. We'll come up with something, because it also, it doesn't quite fit, but it's, uh, but to see that reflected or echoed in Second Temple period, and that's a term we'll use tonight, but Second Temple period overlaps with the New Testament period, um, and it, to, to see that showing up in literature, usually it, it's built on key words, the appearance of key terminology that everybody at that day would set up and take notice. They would know what, and a lot of times you don't have to quote an entire verse. You just mention a couple of the key words, and everyone knows it. Just like today, if you go in most of our churches and we say, you know, for God so loved the world, you don't have to do all of John 3.16. People are very they had a, a, a much better understanding or a much better knowledge of the Scripture and also um, were a lot more sensitive to current ideas about the Scripture as well. All right, one of the questions that I'll bet 20 to 30 percent of the people out here have, because uh, uh, it never ceases anytime I'm, I'm interviewing someone on the terms like these, is this. What day-to-day -day Bible version do you use? 
a lot of people would love to know with you guys. So pass them, start it out, pass the mic around. Okay. Um, well, uh, you heard my answer there last night. It depends on the purpose uh, that I'm using a day-to-day -day version for. Um, uh, I uh, very often use the NIV because back when the NIV was translated, I had some hand in that. Uh, for, for just pleasurable reading and not having to think about meaning too much because it does such a great job from a linguistic standpoint and from a standpoint of translation theory, uh, today's English version. Okay, very good. Jeff? These days I most often use uh, the ESV, uh, particularly at church uh, or, uh, uh, or in worship, uh, which seems to me to... Uh, it does a pretty good job taking the RSV, which was my preferred, and uh, eliminating the rest of the 16th century uh, language so that, it, uh, so that it sounds contemporary. It disappoints me in a verse or two, but overall. All right. Peter? Actually, it's a little bit of a hard one, but um, because it depends on what context. Uh, when I am reading the Psalms, when I'm doing the Psalms, I, I'm using the Liturgy of the Hours, which uses the Grail Psalter. And that's so it's chantable. It's done in a, it's, it, it's done with enough rhythm that it can be chanted then. Um, when I am in, in church, we use the uh, RSV. Um, one of the problems of, uh, we need the Apocrypha, so we uh, definitely have to use the RSV. And we, um, or else, um, uh, Typically reading, I'm using the, um, again, in my devotional reading, will tend to be the uh, New American Bible. In, um, in class, I use the voice, which is, um, a trans uh, which is a translation I have worked on, which a number of us in uh, Houston Baptist University have worked on. But... Um, there, I'm trying to get people to actually read it. They will not read the ESV. They will not read, you know, in fact, a good textbook is problematic for me because students will read it to get the sense of the text rather than read the text. And I'm trying to fish around to find something that I can force students to read or at least will grab them enough that they'll actually read the text. Steve? There's a simple answer, and there's a little bit more involved. And usually when I'm asked that question, and I get asked a lot, students, uh, usually comes after I've beat up a, a particular translation. And uh, so they, they'll go, okay, which one do you use? And I, 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 I repeat to them what I said earlier, and I think it's something always to bear in mind, that every translation is an interpretation. And so I encourage them to read more than one, to get a different perspective from, sort of to hear different voices, and, and when they see a disconnect, to ask the question, why is that? Most of the students, at least the undergraduates, don't have access to the Greek and Hebrew, so they're, I said the best thing you can do is just become sensitive to the disconnect between the various translations. Um, I mean, personally, usually either NIV or RSV. Um, those are usually the ones I gravitate to. And, and again, like my colleagues, it, it depends on the context. Okay. Um, keep the microphone, if you will, and, and we'll that okay. pass it down from there. Um, uh, and this is an opinion question. So each of you may have a different opinion. And, and you can, uh, as the microphone goes down, comment on those that have preceded you. Which New Testament book would you consider to be the most Hebrew in its language? And which New Testament book would you consider to be the most Greek? The first question's easy, Luke. Luke, the most Hebrew? Absolutely, without any question. And when you say Luke, do you include Acts in that, or are you talking simply first of the First half of Acts. Acts, uh, first 15 chapters of Acts. There's clearly a, a, a change, a shift in style in the second half of Acts, we move into uh, the portions that are um, 
generally the author is, is attributed. We get the we sections, you know, where it's the, it seems that the author, and again, tradition has assigned that to Luke, uh, that it seems to be his own style. Um, just like we have the beginning of the prologue, uh, in the first verses of the first chapter, and then there's a sudden shift. Um, but yeah, with any, without, without any question um, for me, and we'll touch on it a little bit this evening, and I know that that sort of cuts against the grain of New Testament scholarship, because most New Testament scholars see Luke as a third-hand writing of the gospel, and, um, but I, I, wouldn't, I would beg to differ. The, the, the lawyer in me would say uh, to you, um, actually siding with you, um, Luke at least claims that he has interviewed firsthand sources exactly. and seems more so than the other gospel writers to be quick to name names and give locations and give uh, signatures to help you identify if you want to go check his sources. To the extent that he is using first-hand material, interviewing whether it's Mary or whether it uh, may be Elizabeth or whomever he may be interviewing, um, would that lend credibility to your position? I, yeah, he's using sources there. Again, it's not an uncommon observation of how Hebraic he is. Uh, it was a sort of a famous article by H.F.D. Sparks in the 40s on the Semitisms of St. Luke. And he, um, he observes that of the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Luke is uh, by far the most Semitic. Um, but he uh, basically, for reasons of his own presumptions, one being that, that Hebrew was a dead language, subject we'll pick up tonight and talk about it. And second, his assumption regarding uh, the reliability the reliances, the interdependence within the Gospels that he's basing his Gospel off of Mark. Um, he assumed that this was Luke uh, septuagintalizing, biblicizing his Greek. Um, the, the problem with that is that some of, some of Luke's uh, style is biblical Hebrew, in which you could say, yeah, there is, it is in the Septuagint. Um, the first problem is that he he made that statement before the de discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. That was in 1943. The world changed in, in biblical scholarship with the discovery of the scrolls. So he can be excused for making that statement. There is no excuse for talking about Hebrew being dead after the discovery of the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. The second thing is that the in terms of his reliance upon Mark or uh, or uh, being Septuagintal is the we have a number of Hebrewisms that are not in the Septuagint, and that Sparks did not pick up on. That goes back to what I was talking earlier about being immersed in a language and getting a feel for a language when there's uh, idioms or word order, and there's no other explanation that he has some source. He talks about eyewitnesses, perhaps written. I have no idea where his sources come from. Uh, what I can say is that the sources for those examples are not Mark and are not Matthew. Now, before you pass the microphone and we get the opinions of the others on this. I, I should just qualify and say yeah. that that statement has just turned the assumptions, of New Test the, the assumptions that underlie New Testament scholarship on their head. That's, that is not generally the view of uh, New Testament scholars. So that's not a small thing in terms of the interdependency of the Gospels. Right, right, right. And Luke and priority, Mark and priority, no, no, all I, the rest of that stuff. No, no, no priority. It's not a question of priority. It's just a question of independence. Yep, 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 yep. I'm, I'm setting all of that aside, though, okay. because I want to ask yep. you something else instead. A number of scholars will readily say, even with Hebraisms being not just present right. but prevalent in Luke, that Luke's Greek writing style is actually uh, some of the best written Greek in the New Testament. Can those two ideas coexist? Yes. Explain, please. Well, it doesn't have to. It, you don't have to destroy issues of word order or idioms. Uh, again, this evening we'll deal with a couple of issues of, of, of word order or syntax. Um, it, some of them are possible in Greek, uh, but the frequency 
the prevalence of them uh, is an indicator that he's working with non-Greek sources or non, uh, they're coming out of a Semitic milieu. Um, and, and the idioms, he'll find, you'll find sometimes in Luke, you'll find him reflected of a Greek writer expressing it, and then suddenly, right in the midst of it, something that doesn't fit a Greek writer. And so it's, uh, I don't want to say he's schizophrenic, but he's, he's, he's just like you find in the Septuagint. When you find the Septuagint, which is the Greek Bible, translating Hebrew, at times you have these stark literal Hebrewisms, but at other times, you, you get the sense that the translator is not completely comfortable with it, and he'll clean it up. He will, he will smooth it out. He will refine it a bit so that it becomes a bit more palatable for a Greek-speaking audience. So there's a, you'll find both in there. The, the difficulty is not finding the, the, the Greek expressions. The, the question mark is why do we find these sort of stark Hebraisms uh, within... Greek's uh, within Luke's narrative. Okay, Weston, most uh, 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 Hebrewish writing in the New Testament and most Greekish. Uh, well, um, I, I uh, would say Luke as well for totally different reasons and without having any contact whatsoever uh, with Stephen having made that decision. I, I came at it from another way. Uh, I sort of fell into it. Um, for um, my uh, first doctorate that I did in a seminary in the States in, uh, in the late 70s, one of the things that I had to do, uh, because I, I was in the Old Testament, but the, one of the things I had to do was uh, take a test in which uh, I had to uh, translate by heart uh, Luke and Acts. And sort of in preparation for doing that, <clears throat> Uh, for several years uh, in our church, I taught an adult Sunday school class uh, going through uh, really section by section, paragraph by paragraph every week of the book of Luke and then Acts. And also, since I was teaching um, a Greek reading in a college, I had my students uh, reading Luke and Acts. So I was getting it from all angles because I knew I had this test coming, see. <laughs> <laughs> then immediately, almost immediately after I, I um, took the test, got my degree, I went to Israel for a year to study modern Hebrew. And, um, and I started, uh, you know, um, getting some of this uh, internal feeling for the language. I began to assimilate the syntax much more than one does if you're just studying it sort of as a bookish uh, foreign language. And, uh, and it, it sort of hit me uh, all of a sudden that um, the Hebrew I was learning to speak could very easily unravel certain problems of meaning or syntax in Luke. And I just came to it myself because it worked and it helped. Hmm. So. All right, most Greek book in the New Testament. Boy, that's, uh, that's a bit of a tough one, as you know as well. Um, I would say uh, you know, some of the epistles, I go for Hebrews. Steve, you're nodding your head. I let you off without having to answer yeah, that. Yeah. Is that yours as well? Okay, are y'all sitting hadn't, together? We hadn't talked about this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah y'all been sitting there. Okay, and let's hand the tape microphone to the right and see if they both agree on something. No, uh, Jeff? I would agree. Book, uh, starting with the most Greek, I would, I would agree on Hebrews, although uh, to, to return to a point that's been mentioned, Hebrews is also a book strikingly informed by the Old Testament and Jewish tradition. So that's uh, another point in favor of, uh, it's not necessarily either or. The language of Hebrews uh, is extremely polished, rhetorical. I, I think Hebrews is the one book that if uh, uh, a literate, uh, cultured Athenian or Alexandrian uh, had heard at the end of the New Testament uh, uh, might really make him uh, him or her think, wow, these, these Christians uh, 
uh, you know, they're a, uh, they're a well-informed lot. They've, they've been to school and learned how to write. Um, there are passages in Luke that have the same quality, um, and while uh, I'm, I'm going to crawfish around to, to disagree with Steve about Luke being the most Semitic uh, book of the New Testament, it seems to me that Luke is the most versatile stylist, uh, certainly of the evangelists, I think, in the New Testament. He's the, uh, he's the best at evoking a sense of place, uh, and so when events are in Galilee, in Jerusalem, around the temple, one, one really does get uh, a, a Semitic biblical feel uh, from Luke's narrative. When Paul uh, preaches in Athens, uh, however, the narrative has a kind of, uh, a kind of classical uh, sheen to it. You can sort of hear echoes of, of Socrates uh, in the language. Um, I would think the most Semitic book uh, in the New Testament in terms of its syntax and idiom uh, is the book of Revelation, uh, to the point of, on occasion, being ungrammatical uh, uh, in, in Greek. Uh, and so it, it seems to me the most uh, directly influenced uh, uh, by Semitisms. Ab about Steve's very interesting comments about Luke, um, it seems to me that Luke, if the we passages are accurate, uh, or, or suggest Luke's participation in some of the events that he's narrating in Acts, as I think they do, then he's been interacting uh, with Christian teachers, uh, many of whom are bilingual. He's been talking to them about stories of Jesus and, uh, and the proclamation of the gospel. He's, do, he's been doing that for some years when he comes to write the gospel and Acts. New Testament scholars sometimes treat the evangelists as though uh, they were principally authors. None of them was. Uh, they were principally teachers uh, in churches in missionary contexts who eventually decided to write. Uh, and I think we may well see some of that reflected in Luke's language. So I'd, I would see Luke as uh, Septuagintal in style and someone who has interacted with lots of Christian teachers, many of them reflecting uh, uh, the Jerusalem milieu. Peter? Well, it's, it's um, I'm trying to think of what sort of an oddball I can throw in here. But <laughs> on the one hand, I, I would certainly agree that uh, there are places of Luke which are some of the best. Uh, and uh, Hebrews, yeah, I mean, in terms of Greek style, uh, but also 1 Peter chapter 1. Um, I remember my, um, my New Testament professor at um, uh, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School uh, pointing this out to me. He, his degree actually was, or this is, his study was in, in, in classical Greek. And he says, as you see some of the most beautiful Greek sentences in 1 Peter 1. Um, in another sense, 2 Peter is very good Greek, but it's not what's called the Attic style, the style of Athens, so to speak. It's the style of Asia, and it is, um, which is a much more bombastic, booming style. He's interacting with a different type of Greek philosophy than uh, one Peter is. And um, if you take style into, again, what is good? If you're in control of a certain style, um, it, it, um, even if you don't, uh, which even if you don't, uh, please say the upper crust. Let me give you uh, an example. Um, uh, there's a translation of the Bible uh, of the New Testament or parts of the New Testament which you may or may not know, Cotton Patch Version. Okay. Cotton Patch Version was written to make it come alive in the South. In the... Georgian farmer dialect. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so the Good Samaritan is going from, you know, Birmingham to, uh, I mean, the people, the man who gets you know, beat up in the Good Samaritan. It's going from Birmingham to, uh, to Montgomery or something like that. Can anything good come out of Valdosta is the <laughs> translation. Yeah. So um, Clarence Jordan was in control of that style. 
you know, I couldn't do that, but that isn't something that would go down well in New York City or, you know, uh, let alone in Harvard um, or something like that. Or even in some churches, if you recall how he translated meganoito from Romans. Yeah. <laughs> uh, May it never be was translated in Georgian Pharma dialect as, how do you put this politely? Um, I believe the actual Bible translation in the Cotton Patch version is hell no. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, well, you know, Clarence Jordan was shot at because his translation communicated too well. Yeah. Um, but uh, at any rate, Second Peter is the Asiatic style. It's, it's a very different style than First Peter, but it has some of the, the high... Um, uh, it's good Asiatic style, the same way as uh, First Peter has sections, and James to some degree, but First Peter even more um, of um, almost Attic, what's called Attic purity, the, um, the uh, sort of Athens style. Now, worst uh, that is most, um, yeah, I think I like, I, I really like Revelation for that. <laughs> <laughs> is, well, revelation, okay. revelation is is just so um, un Greek. You know, you you read it, you realize you're reading Greek words, but there it's almost as if it's glossing, or or sort of you're putting the words down for some other type of thought, different type of grammar. Uh, which brings up an, another subject. Uh, uh, the influence of the Septuagint on the Greek of the New Testament. And, and here's why I'm asking. You take a book like Revelation, which you if, excise the letters to the seven churches. Okay, so take out those couple of chapters. But chapter 1, chapter 4 through 22, you will be hard-pressed to find a verse that doesn't have some Old Testament quotation, reference, allusion. Generally out of the Septuagint, perhaps, but not always out of the Septuagint. Sometimes, uh, well, actually, okay, I'm not a scholar in it, but generally Septuagintal. So how much of the Septuagint has influenced the way the Greek New Testament has been written? And we can, Steve, we'll start at this end, and this way you get to comment on what everybody else has said and fix it. Okay, so Peter, you're served up first. Okay. A lot. But it's hard, sometimes it's hard to tell. I mean, for instance, take Revelation. It is chock full. But stylistically, I'm not sure the places where it isn't chock full, so to speak, where it has a bit less are any better, but does that mean that he's so absorbed his Septuagint that he, as I use my illustration, he's speaking King James English and doesn't realize it? We agree on a lot <laughs> as the answer. Um, I think one difference between the way we think about the Bible and the way the ancients, or at least many of the ancients, thought about the Bible uh, was, we, we had the discussion a few moments ago, which version, singular, is the best, or the right one, or you know, the one to use, and, uh, and then uh, was a given writer of the New Testament uh, reading the Greek text, or the Hebrew text, or the Targum, or what? Um, in, in the ancient context, for many interpreters anyhow, uh, competing versions of scripture presented opportunities for new discovery. You didn't necessarily have to choose between uh, the, the, the Hebrew text and the Greek text. You could look at both and discover nuances, insight uh, in both of them. And so I would see the author of Revelation uh, as someone who grew up uh, with the scriptures in Hebrew uh, and who internalized those to a significant degree, and then as an adult came to minister uh, 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 in uh, Greek-speaking churches, uh, and so appropriated the Septuagint so as to be able to function in those churches, to, uh, to uh, 
uh, talk to people in their own language uh, and uh, to uh, invoke a text that they might have access to. And so I, I think you can see a, a kind of interaction between those different versions in the text of Revelation and elsewhere in the New Testament as well. Maybe I, I could say it in a little bit different way, and I really kind of agree. And, and that is, first of all, uh, it's, uh, I think we have a bit of a misunderstanding if we talk about the Septuagint or a Septuagint text. Which is really going to no be such my follow-up question. Yeah, the letter really of no Orestius aside, were there multiple Septuagint texts? Yeah, multiple texts. texts. And, the, and remember, too, that all the, although Josephus' story about the translation of the, of the Septuagint um, you know, probably has a lot of truth to it, that they were talking really only about the first five books. We are talking about the Torah. Uh, and whatever was done um, later, well, you know, who knows? But there are many, not many, there are, what, at least half a dozen Septu Septuagint texts that have come down to us. That's number one. Number two, if a person's bilingual or trilingual or quadrilingual, um, and that's one thing that that you do live in, say, in today's Israel. Um, my assistant is perfectly um, fluent in five different languages, reading, writing, and speaking. And that's not unusual. But if you're only bilingual, trilingual, okay, but you know the Hebrew text fairly well. So if you are speaking, or writing in Greek, why not translate yourself ad hoc? Or quote part of a translation that may be written down and do it the rest yourself. Happens all the time, happens all the time. Uh, and and um, even today, I personally know people in Israel, they were my uh, fellow students at Hebrew University who have, who have the entire Old Testament memorized in Hebrew. Uh, and who, uh, all you have to do is give them half a sentence. I know two of these people, uh, Steve must know some too, he's shaking his head. All you have to do is give them half a sentence anywhere in the entire Old Testament, and they will start quoting it, you know, until it's time to dinner, for dinner, or until you're too tired. I have seen it, and it happens. Now, that's sort of a person, and there may, probably were many in, uh, you know, in, in the Second Temple period. Uh, would just as soon come up with his own translation in Greek. Um, and actually, um, you know, as Steve says, uh, maybe, maybe we have some of the same games, but I, I notice myself sometimes if I'm a little bit bored in church or something, which could happen, <laughs> um, and maybe, you know, when I have the English text in front of me, I kind of play a game with myself and see how well I can translate that, that back into Hebrew while I'm sitting there listening. I mean, is that kind of a... Maybe, I think a lot of a us do thing? that. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm joking. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> anyway, why, why, not, why not in the ancient world? So I, I'm, not, I'm a little uncomfortable talking about Septuagint influence unless we define all the various possibilities of uh, the Old, Test Old Testament translations of the Hebrew. So the question was, how much is the Septuagint influence? You were speaking specifically about Revelation, but I think generally in terms of the use of Scripture in the New Testament. Y yes, yes, not Revelation. Okay. Revelation right. was an example I was using. Right. I'd like it to be broader, New Testament. Uh, I mean, I, I would agree with a, a number of the observations that Weston makes. Uh, I think it's a, uh, sometimes you, you don't realize that there's only so many ways you can say something. You know, just because you can say lehiot or lo lehiot, to be or to not to be in Hebrew does not mean that Shakespeare was an Israeli. Just there's certain, there certain ways that you say things that lend themselves, and you oftentimes find commentaries having a discussion among themselves over some phrase in, the, let's say, the Gospels. The question of, is this Septuagintal or not? And why are they asking that question? because the Septuagint has rendered the Hebrew so literally that there's really 
not much other way that you can say it. And so you're limited in terms of your options. And so, like if I'm reading Fitzmaier and Luke, he'll say, it's difficult to know whether this, Luke is using the Septuagint here or whether they're just both this, rendering it the same way. And I think, uh, I think the, the fact that we're dealing probably with people who are multilingual, again, there, there's, there, it's a, oftentimes when I'm reading, I'm noticing that they are, um, they're reflect, sometimes I'll find the, the writers in the scripture being more Hebraic than the Septuagint. That is not a rare thing, to find them rendering something that is even more Hebraic in its expression than the Septuagint has rendered it. And, it's, uh, and I think the problem when we quickly sort of identify and say everything is, or when we say this is Septuagintal, this is Septuagintal, occasionally we miss the, the creativity that's going on. I'll, I'll do an example tonight where because a lot of scholars just say, oh, this is just Luke using the Septuagint, we miss the dynamic of what Jesus is doing when he's exegeting Scripture because what he's doing cannot be in Greek. Uh, and I should go even farther and say we have not a single example of a first century sage working with Scripture in any other version than Hebrew. So the fact that we have the Septuagint is, you know, it's, it's interesting. It, it sheds light. It sort of brings, especially for those who don't, read Hebrew, intimate, you know, don't know it intimately in terms of the Septuagint sort of gives them a bridge to engaging Hebrew syntax or expressions, but it's not, it doesn't tell us everything, and sometimes it falls short. So that's always where I get nervous when they, um, when we quickly talk about Septuagintalisms. I, not that I'm pushing my article, but in the volume that you have here in the library on the, we edited in this spring, uh, the language environment, the first century, first century Judea, I did an article called um, Non-Septuagintal Hebraisms in the Third Gospel, an Inconvenient Truth, <laughs> okay, uh, which is you know, tipping my hat to Al Gore, but I mean, it's the fact that you have this realia there that most scholars look over, uh, look over, and it's, it's inconvenient. It doesn't fit into the paradigm but it has to be addressed. We have, uh, we have a lot of times uh, Hebraic elements, particularly in Scripture, even the use of Scripture, where the quotation citation is actually even more Septuagintal uh, or more Hebraic than the Septuagint itself. Okay, we're about to wind down, and, and I've, you guys have been fantastic. We've got about 10 minutes left, which gives you a couple of minutes apiece. So, this is a question that you may not have an answer for. I don't know your qualifications on this and how ready you are for it. This is a bit from left field, though at least Weston, I know, taught some church history, so you're fair game on this. But I'd like each of you, as much as you're able to, to answer it. Hebraisms beyond New Testament Scripture in the patristic writings, do we see as the church became more Hellenized that the writings, whether we're looking at Clement, whether we're looking at uh, the Didache, whatever we may want to look at, the early shepherd, uh, the early New Testament, post-New Testament patristic writings, do you see a shift from these strong Hebraisms that you have in the New Testament towards something that is a bit more, uh, if not Attic, at least a... Uh, you know, has Jerusalem truly sold out for Athens? You know. Yeah, I want all four of you. I'd love to hear your perspectives, though it's not a very fair question to send you from left field because you probably haven't been asked that at least this week. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure that that uh, uh, really is something that, that I have the expertise to answer. I did teach patristics. I taught apostolic fathers, um, but uh, I did it, I, I taught the content and not the linguistics of it. And although, so you're going to make me go get Bart Ehrman and ask him because he tr <laughs> translated no, no. the Loeb <laughs> no, edition? No, 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 uh, but I think I'd have to take it, um, uh, you know, book by book, say, for example, Didache, 
or the Shepherd of Hermas, okay. Um, and and uh, I, th I think you'd have to take it geographically, too. Uh, we know that there was quite a bit of difference in the composition of churches, even within the Asian Minor itself, Egypt, um, Palestine, or whatever you want to call it from that era, uh, Greece, and so forth. Um, so uh, the audience would be different from place to place. I'm not, sh but I but I suspect that that there was a change by the fourth century. But but you know I'd have to look. Who who was the church? Uh, uh, early church. I may have been Tertullian, he's a lawyer, so I'd love to give him credit, um, that spoke about the Hellenizing of the faith and referenced it as plundering the Egyptians, going to the Greeks and getting their good ideas and bringing it into uh, the church. Yeah, and that probably was done, but again, it's just a guess. Okay. Uh, it probably, probably was done on, on the part of the Gentiles in the church, uh, not the Jews, became less and less. All right, well, let's pass the mic around. It seems to me, not having studied this issue and just asking idiotic questions, that once you've got the demise of the second temple and once you've got uh, the destruction of, of the Jewish presence in, in, in Israel in, in the sense that it was there during the, the New Testament era, at least, that you're going to see a natural dwindling away of the Hebraisms, but... What do I know? So, Jeff? Well, it's an interesting and, and very complex question. Um, and at the linguistic level, I would agree uh, uh, to a great deal with Weston. I would, I would need to go look. You can make some generalizations. Uh, the Didache, the teaching of the Twelve Apostles, is very evocative of a Jewish milieu someplace like Antioch is often connected uh, with the gospel according to Matthew uh, in, in interpretation. And, uh, Matthew usually regarded as the most usually regarded as the most Hebraic uh, of the Gospels. We've had two. I think we've had two other answers to that question here. Um, uh, uh, Ignatius reflects the Asiatic style uh, that uh, Peter mentioned. Uh, First Clement is uh, uh, is uh, at, at the other end of the register, atticizing rhetorical. On the other hand, if if one looks at the question a bit more broadly than, than at the level of language. Um, there's a point very well made by Tom Wright uh, in the best book he's written, uh, in case anyone's making a list. Uh, it's, it's before anyone had heard of him. Uh, in 1992, he wrote a book called The New Testament and the People of God, uh, which if you've read other Wright and you haven't, that, haven't read that one, you haven't read Wright's best. It's a fantastic book. Um, a point he makes toward the end of the book is that if one looks through the first two centuries of early Christian history, and one looks at the points where Christianity comes into public conflict with the Roman Empire, the issues over which the early Christians quarreled with Rome were issues of fundamentally Jewish conviction, issues about uh, the one God and about his redemption uh, of Israel and of the nations now accomplished, uh, uh, now accomplished through Christ. So it, it's... Uh, <laughs> In a way, one might call that the big Hebraism of the New Testament, this, this text written in Greek, which took a bunch of people from pagan backgrounds uh, and taught them, uh, taught them the faith of Israel in a, in a new key. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's part of the, the, the real problem, is everyone's using the the biblical material, and um, to that extent, you're going to be influenced by, by we could say, Hebraic or Jewish thought, uh, and, and that's, that's quite, quite critical. If you ask, what were they reading? Um, I would say, in the Catholic epistles, there's no evidence, with one exception, one possible exception, in Jude, that anyone had read the uh, biblical text in Hebrew, um, or even knew any Hebrew, um, that um, uh, 
in, in fact, in Second Peter, there's no evidence that anyone has, re has ever read a biblical text. Um, they, it's all influenced by secondary literature that stands between there. But, and, and I've argued that at some length in, 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 in this or that publication, but still, so it's come down. If you go to the um, uh, monks of uh, the early monastic movement in the Egyptian desert, um, now I can click on here and I can come up with iCoptic that will give me all my psalms. They couldn't, they memorized the whole Psalter. Um, probably, possibly in Coptic, possibly in Greek. But um, they memorized the whole Psalter. They also memorized the New Testament because they had to repeat it every day. Um, you know, they, uh, they did not have iPads to uh, use as a crutch. Uh, in that case, my battery had just run out. Uh, <laughs> if I had to spend three and a half hours repeating it. So, I mean, it's, it's going to be in your blood if you're doing that. Um, even though it may not be a, you're thinking of an original language or a language that you have any contact in, even any interest in. We know Augustine criticized um, uh, Jerome for looking at Hebrew manuscripts and, and translating the Vulgate and so on. So, um, yeah, I think there was uh, certainly an, an influence, a strong influence of uh, of uh, Greek thought. Um, after all, if you were educated, you had read all the Greek classics. That's what you, you would be steeped in them. Um, but at the same time, because everybody was uh, in church, read the, um, uh, we could say the biblical canon, or some version of it, um, they also had absorbed that. So I'm not sure it's a real either or, it sort of depends on what do you mean by. Steve, last word. Yeah, I think what we're discussing actually is a trajectory that begins already in the New Testament. Um, take one of the most common semitisms, uh, Jesus' most frequent uh, most numerous self-designation is the Son of Man, something that's steeped in a Semitic uh, milieu. It doesn't really do much for you in Greek. Uh, and it's no example that Paul never uses it. The term that Jesus most frequently calls himself, Paul never employs it, never uses it, because I think for his audience, it didn't fit, it didn't resonate. And what we're watching is we're watching a trajectory of the gospel moving into the Gentile world, and, and events eventually lead. Um, you know, we can talk about the Didache, you know, the Didache, which is probably the first half of it is a pre-existing Jewish document, so it's steeped in 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 the Jewish environment. But the, you know, you're moving into the second century with the Bar Kokhba revolt in 132 to 135. And uh, Eusebius talks about that up until that time, you had the bishops of the circumcision in Jerusalem. Afterwards, it's the bishops of the uncircum non-circumcision. So the, the dynamic, the sort of the makeup of the church is changing. It's moving out away from a Jewish context, uh, a Hebrew language context. And so the scriptures of the church, I think more and more, increasingly more so, are the Greek translations. Till you get, uh, I mean, I, I've worked in one of the last pre-Byzantine works by Eusebius uh, in the late 90s, a uh, good friend of mine, friend of Jim Hoffmeyer's and others in here, uh, the late Anson Rainey came to me and said, uh, no one's ever translated Eusebius' onomasticon. Uh, it's it, to English, and would you please do it? And I said, well, I'm not trained for that. And he says, yes, you are get after it. So I set about doing it and working through his, it's a, it's a gazetteer of all the places mentioned in the Bible uh, within the Holy Land and it's like a snapshot of what uh, Roman Palestine looked like, probably written 305, 306, there are no churches in it, 
Um, it's probably one of the most important works for archaeology or historical geography because it's where you start trying to locate where places are because he said, well, it would be you go up the road 10 miles, turn left, and you find the spot. And so we're trying to find where those places are. But what's interesting is that he's oftentimes using, the reason I was coming back to the Septuagint, is he uses the Septuagint, not the Hebrew Bible, the Septuagint. And I can say, personally attest to this, that 10% of his sites don't exist. An adverb in Hebrew that was not understood by a Greek translator got translated as a proper name. And so we have places in the Septuagint that are that literally do not exist. 10%, there's 980 something, it's been a few years since I worked on it, but it's uh, over 900, almost 1,000 sites. A good 10% of those are mistakes at the Septuagint. In other words, he's not using, even though he's in Palestine, he's the Bishop of Caesarea, he's there, he doesn't use the Hebrew Bible, and 10% of his list are places that are not places. They are mistakes, translation mistakes, that show their way up in Eusebius' work. So that's, there you can see the Septuagint clear. Uh, and he's clearly relying upon the Septuagint, for better or for worse. Uh, and I, again, I think what we do is we're seeing a trajectory that it goes from Paul right into the Byzantine Empire, and the, the whole interplay between Hebrew and Greek, uh, you can see it play out in these individuals. Well, we look forward to hearing you tonight, Steve, and we appreciate each of y'all for your discussions with us. Thank you.